Hello, my name is Niall Jefferson and welcome to this podcast in the ENT Expert Opinion Series. The topic of this podcast is the entity known as Fungal Ball and our guest expert is Associate Professor Richard Harvey. Professor Harvey completed training in uh, otolaryngology head and neck surgery. He went on to perform fellowship training with Valerie Lund in the United Kingdom and then Rod Schlosser in the United States with some additional time in Sao Paulo, Brazil. He's widely published as both author and editor and has presented and taught nationally and internationally. He has a keen interest in nose, sinus, allergy and skull-based conditions as well as a keen academic and research commitment. So let's begin by asking, what is the pathological process that leads to its formation? Well, thanks for having me along, Niall. <clears throat> I'm glad you let it out as fungal ball being an entity rather than a subgroup of chronic rhinosinusitis, because that's really what it is. It's an isolated condition that occurs within the compartmentalised space of the paranasal sinuses. And you can indeed get a fungal ball really in any one of the paranasal sinus cavities. And I think when I think of cavities, I don't think of the ethmoid cavity, but I mean within the anatomical limits of a bony uh, functional air cell within the sinuses. At the heart of fungal ball, even though it's often mentioned with other fungal-related paranasal sinus conditions, it really is just a foreign body reaction. The nature of fungal ball and what is thought to be the pathoetiogenesis of it is that there is an initial inciting event that creates edema, mucociliary dysfunction, and failure of clearance of the normal mucus blanket within a paranasal sinus cell. The most common places for this to occur is in with the maxillary sinus and the sphenoid. And there may be issues here in the fact that these sinuses drain through small ostia and they actually have a very large surface area from which to drain from. It's thought that some of the inciting events might be just a simple cold, but there is studies to show that other events, such as endodontic work on the maxillary sinus and um, nasal intubation, are both associated with an increased rate of fungal ball formation. The theory here is that Whatever the inciting event is, a viral infection, an endodontic procedure on the floor of the maxillary sinus, um, or nasal intubation, that this leads to nasal inflammation and local mucosal inflammation. You get stasis of the mucociliary blanket and um, function of the sinus, and fungus settles just as it does on a piece of bread that you would leave out in the kitchen overnight. Of course, this is probably true for all particles that are sitting in the paranasal sinuses. And the mucus blanket clears the paranasal sinus very quickly, probably within 15 or 20 minutes, the entire surface area of the sinus is cleared out. Dust, pollens, tree, animal dander, these are all antigens and products, as well as um, other things that are in the environment, particulate matter, that will settle on the sinus. However, fungal ball is unique because when fungus settles in the sinus, it is not an inert substance, it can replicate. And so what starts off as a little plaque of fungus, unless mucociliary function returns in time, that plaque of fungus will eventually accumulate and become a ball of fungus. Once that's happened, a critical point is probably reached in which the mass of material, now just foreign material inside the sinus, is so much that it's not able to be cleared by the normal mucociliary function and be swept out through the ostia. So even at that point, mucociliary function does start to return, you've automatically got, unfortunately, a foreign material or foreign substance in there. And that, I think, is the nature of what fungal ball is all about. And you see this in the pathology, that fungal ball patients either have limited or just a foreign body reaction to the fungal ball, it's just a minor lymphocytic infiltrate, or they get secondarily infected and it's more a neutrophilic um, infiltrate just in that sinus alone. Yeah. There's no other um, elements uh, to inflammation in the paranasal sinuses. I think that's very clear. 
having said all of that, how do these patients typically present? So patients with fungal pore, there's two ways in which they present. They either present generally as secondary infections, so they become secondary infected. It's common to see bugs such as Staph aureus infect a cavity that is inherently dysfunctional because it has foreign material. And I think the spectrum of bacteria that you see is very similar to when there is other material, such as calcifications, rhinoliths, foreign bodies that are left behind in sinuses, such as swabs. The range of microbiology is exactly the same. And when it gets infected, people may present with just a grumbling low-grade infection with discharge, or there are examples of where the infection is really like a typical planktonic infection with premaxillary facial cellulitis. They can present, and probably potentially more commonly, as incidental findings on a scan in which they're causing very little symptoms, maybe just a sensation of pressure or discomfort for the patient, and the scan was done for another reason. That probably is the most common way, but the other presenting feature is, of course, um, mild uh, inflammatory discharge. I think you've probably covered parts of the next question, but uh, with those elements in mind, are there certain other parts of the history that you're looking for that would point you to say, prior to imaging, that this may well represent a fungal ball? Yes, I think that's really important. There are a couple of things that are important. So um, when it comes to history, often the history is very long. So when patients say, I've had pressure sensations, often there for many, many months, potentially even years. And they may have had infective flare-ups that were actually treated with antibiotics. Although that said, traditionally, once the fungal ball does get infected, it often really settles down and it becomes symptomatic from that point onwards. A key feature of this, though, and what separates it and sh- should make sure that it's not included with other forms of chronic rhinosinusitis, is that these patients don't generally have a history of airway inflammation. So they're not patients who are atopic, they don't generally have allergy, they haven't suffered from serious sinus problems in the past, and they don't have asthma. So I think once you um, have those elements, then I think that they're probably in keeping with a fungal ball. The absence of significant local symptoms is also an important thing. When they're present, including bleeding, I think the diagnosis should be shifted to excluding more serious pathology, such as neoplasia. With these patients, you see them in the rooms, you have your level of suspicion, but based around <coughs> someone with sinus-related uh, concerns, what is your sequence of investigations that you would typically arrange? So when I see a patient in my rooms, um, more often than not for an ENT surgeon, they will present with a CT scan because they've had it done, or an MRI scan. Um, I would organise a CT scan myself if I saw an isolated discharge coming from a sinus where there was a suspicion of a fungal ball. Uh, and in fact, when you see a single opacified sinus cell, the fungal ball should be one of the four differentiating diagnoses that one should see on a CT scan. So if you have a CT scan and that there is a single opacified cell, it's not automatically a fungal ball. It could be a mucosil, it could also be an encephalocil or meningoencephalocil, and it could also be neoplasia. A great acronym here is FMEN for fungal ball, mucosal, and cephalocele neoplasia. And it's a great um, differential diagnosis for a single opacified um, sinus cell. Um, when I organise uh, a scan, I generally organise a CT scan. I don't believe MRI scans are helpful unless there's the thought that the fungal ball is invading beyond the limits of the sinuses and the diagnosis may be incorrect. On a CT scan, you will often see thickened bone. We term this osteitis, but it's a bit of a misnomer, as there are studies to show that it's more likely just to be near osteogenesis and new bone formation. And this often leads to the chronicity, and it's probably secondary to the reactive change that the foreign material within the sinus induces. I often will swab patients at the time of their examination, not so much because I think we're going to use it in the preoperative setting, but when it comes to surgery, rather than blindly giving them empirical prophylactic antibiotics, you actually have some guidance here with a swab. Excellent. Having come to the diagnosis, what then is the role of medical therapy for this condition? We always talk about sinus-related disease and medical therapy first, and if that fails, surgery. 
Is this different? Yeah, absolutely. So that concept is completely does not apply to fungal bore. There is no medical treatment for fungal bore whatsoever. And I'm of the opinion that most fungal bores should be treated and offered treatment for them. That doesn't mean patients who come along who are asymptomatic and find they've got a sinus full of fungus may not wish to have it treated, but they are a surgical treatment. And I think as a surgeon, you should offer someone surgery. If they decline, that's not a problem, but you should tell them that it's unlikely to go away. Resolution of fungal balls is very rare. They often persist for many, many years, and they're, they will be associated with sinus dysfunction eventually in the long term. So I think if you just explain it to patients that they have a ball of fungus, what you're going to do is open the sinus up, wash out the fungus, and importantly, set the sinus up so they can use some form of irrigation bottle to provide clearance of the mucus blanket until mucociliary function returns, that this will lead to recovery and rehabilitation of the sinus and it should function normally afterwards. Antifungals and other forms of medical treatment are not required in this condition. Um, as far as surgery is concerned, uh, do you expand beyond the area involved or do you limit your surgery to the sinus, for example, that's affected? So this is an important thing because the surgery for fungal ball, you really just need to address that one sinus. But it depends on where it is. And I'm going to use the two examples of the maxillary sinus and the sphenoid sinus as what, what I would do. So if it was a sphenoid fungal ball, this is one of the very few occasions, maybe apart from pituitary surgery, that I would do a transnasal approach to the sphenoid. All one needs to do is widely open the anterior face of the sphenoid, starting at the natural ostium, extend it as far down to the floor as you can. You will often come across the septal branch and bipolar it. And my suggestion here for anyone doing that sort of surgery is that if you've bitten down with a down kerosene and come to the floor of the sphenoid size and you still haven't seen the septal branch, then you've actually gone through it and it's just under spasm. And you should go back with a bipolar because it has to be there, at least one branch of it. Once you widen the sphenoid ostium as wide as you can, it's not good enough just to poke a sucker in and wash it out because it's unlikely that mucociliary function will return straight away. So I think you need to set them up so they can keep washing that sinus out for at least some time. And studies have shown that probably six weeks is probably the earliest that you're going to see mucociliary recovery for someone who's had a long-standing problem like a fungal ball. If it comes to another area, such as the maxillary sinus, one has to remember that when we do sinus surgery, it always has to be functional. So you can do individual functional units. So if you want to do the anterior group, and I would do that all together. You do a simple unsenectomy, open antrostomy. And antrostomy to me means when you come to general, general anesthesia and have an antrostomy, I widely open the ostium through the posterior fontanelle, remove all of the uncinate so that you can widely open the maxillary sinus. I remove the uncinate as high as I possibly can, maybe even opening the front face of the agonazi and make sure that the top edge or the edge of my uncinectomy is very clean. I would then remove the bulla, making sure that the top edge of the bulla is not parallel or the same horizontal line as my cut edge of uncinate. That's because when doing the surgery, we are including the maxillary sinus and the antrethmoid as in a complete functional compartment. And at the very top of our compartment is our frontal recess, which although we're not going to dissect it, we want to make sure that it's not going to be um, iatrogenically affected by the surgery. I take great care at making sure that all the fungal material is removed. And in the maxillary sinus, it's very easy to leave behind anterior and inferior fungal ball material. And if you can't simply wash it out at the time of surgery and it's giving you difficulty, you can guarantee that the patient will never be able to do it, even with a high volume wash bottle. So it's imperative that all foreign material be removed. I almost never perform an extended Auxiliary procedure, such as a modified mural maxillectomy, excessive trephines or cordial luck approach to just to get fungal material out. Time and patience with curved suckers, um, washing in fluid under pressure will almost always clear this area. So they're the two sort of common areas. If you were to do posterior ethmoid, then you would have to do a complete ethmoidectomy. As going through the basal lamella, you end up 
go in through um, a non-functional area and therefore you're committed to opening every ethmoid cell. Having performed your surgery and removed your fungal ball, what would be your routine post-operative management for this? So my patients would get 10 days of antibiotic therapy, augmentin, um, or what is directed from culture treatment. Then they would use a saline irrigation morning and night, and they would only use it morning and night. I believe regimes that are based around four or five times a day are merely just setting the patient up to be blamed for failure or success. And just using something morning and night is very important. Once you have it morning and night, they see me at, they start washing the very next day. They come and see me at one week. I like to leave a middle meatal spacer in the form of a gloved finger. Or, or as you say, a glove mirror cell. Um, we take that out at one week. I make sure that everything's looking well. I don't use post-operative steroids for someone with fungal ball. I don't give any other sort of prolonged antibiotics or any fungals. None of that is necessary. And then I get them to wash. I watch them at three weeks. The reason I get them back at three weeks because if something's not going right with your cavity, such as you've got adhesions between the middle turbinate and the inferior turbinate, Um, or there's a block of fibrous tissue that's formed where you don't want it to form, it is still very easy to do something in three weeks to divide it. And then I don't see them again until three months. And these are one of the great patients where when they come back at three months, they should have a completely normal sinus system, and that's the last time you need to see them. There is one caveat to this, though. When I was a trainee, I used to see these patients come back, and they were given simple sprays in their nose, And when they would return, everything would be healed, but when you'd look inside the maxillary sinus, there was a little pool of pus, or it looked like pus, and it really just discoloured mucus in the floor of the maxillary sinus. And this is not a sign of infection. The lining and the mucosa often looks quite normal when you see this. This is a sign of failure of mucociliary recovery, and almost always induces a re-education of the patient of how they're using the wash bottle, their compliance, and if they're doing everything right, you just encourage them to keep going a little bit longer and maybe see them in a month or two to make sure that that mucus that is sitting there, it's really mucus stasis, recovers and functions normally again. I think it's very unusual to need to do such something like a modified medial maxillectomy in order to enable patients to wash out after fungal balls. That said, in patients who've had other things done to their sinus, such as corbal luck procedures, inferior meatal antrostomies, then I think sometimes you're committed to do something like a modified middle maxillectomy. And whether you call that mega antrostomy where you drop it down to the floor, but the concept here is that you're just taking away the sump that exists within the maxillary sinus. Maybe you might see this after radiotherapy. So someone who's had fungal ball after radiotherapy and previous radiation, maybe you might consider doing something like that, knowing that return of mucosary function may be dubious in that patient. That's fantastic. Well, look, I think that uh, represents a fairly comprehensive uh, discussion on the ins and outs of fungal ball. Before we finish, I'd like to give you the opportunity to have the final word. Now, that may be something that we've covered in the talk that you think is particularly relevant to wrap up this discussion, or it may be something that we haven't discussed but you think is worth touching upon. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, so I, the only thing I would say here is that fungal balls are common, and because they're in a slowly enlarging process, they can present with thinning, medialization of the maxillary wall um, into the nose, sometimes bone loss, um, but this is not a signs of invasion. And I think when fungal balls present, they're usually relatively clear that that's just a simple fungal ball. And the diagnosis of fungal invasion in these patients has to be very, very clear that they're usually immunocompromised host and that they've got a reason for invasion and that it's biopsy proven that not that fungus is in there, but the actual fungus is involving the tissue and even signs that it's involving vascular tree. So I think that's the most important thing Um, And certainly, just because there's failure of return of function to the sinus shouldn't induce the use of antifungals or other treatments. I think this is really just a lack of functional return. So that would be my overlying statement. I see them all too often treated inappropriately rather than um, just ensuring good rehabilitation of the sinus. Well, thanks very much, Richard. Um, 
Thanks for joining us. Please look for other ENT Expert Opinion podcast titles. We can be contacted via email on entexpertopinion at gmail.com.